Hey guys, this is Brian Douglas here from Control System Laboratories. In this video, I want to discuss with you some of the methods that we use to perform system identification. And we're going to do that with a very simple but informative experiment. I have here a spring, but this isn't any ordinary spring. It's, well, actually it is just an ordinary spring. So ordinary, in fact, that I just purchased it right down the street at the local hardware store. This type of spring is called an extension spring, and that's because it's designed to operate only in one direction. That's the extended direction, or the pulling direction. It can't compress any further than the neutral state. That's because all of the loops of the spring are physically connected and contacting each other. So in order to compress it any further than this, you'd have to crush or bend the metal, which we're not going to do in this experiment. Now, before we get started and actually begin the system identification process on this spring, I want to give you a little bit of background information, and in order to do that, we have to go to the blackboard. System identification is one of three general problems associated with dynamics and control. Let me explain them this way. If you're given an arbitrary system, S, and it has inputs U of T and outputs Y of T, then we can state the following. If we know the inputs and we know the system dynamics, then we can find the outputs through simulation. That is, we can predict how the system will behave by playing the inputs through it. That's the first problem. For the second problem, if we know the system and we know how we want the outputs to behave, then we can determine the appropriate inputs through various control methods. This is the general controls problem how to change the inputs to a system in order for it to behave the way we want. And lastly, if we know the inputs and we know the outputs, then we can determine what the system looks like through a process called system identification. And this is what we're going to focus on in this video. Now there are at least two general ways to accomplish this. The first way is referred to as the black box method. Imagine that you have no idea what's inside of a box because it's too dark inside for you to see. Now you could subject what was in that box to various known inputs, then measure the outputs, and then finally infer what's inside the box based on the relationship between the two. Now the second way to do system identification is referred to as the white box method. Imagine now you're able to shine a light into the box and see exactly what was in there. Now knowing the components that make up the system, you could just write the differential equations directly. And this is exactly what you're doing when you're writing Newton's equations of motion or you're determining what the equations of motions are based on uh, the energy in the system. But it's this white box method that we're going to start with in our example with the spring. So let's go back to it. So for this white box method, we're going to try to write the differential equations for this spring directly. Now we know that the force of a spring is a function of the stretched or compressed distance. F equals a function of X. And if we assume that this spring is linear, then we can simplify it down to the force of a spring is equal to the spring constant k times the distance x. And we're hoping that this spring is linear because, as I've stated in previous videos, we know how to solve linear equations. Now, I actually have no idea what the equations are for this particular spring right now. Uh, like I said, I just purchased it at the store and it's just some kind of gate spring or something. I didn't buy it because of its linear qualities. But I can tell just from inspection that this isn't a linear spring. Now forget for just one second that there is no such thing as a linear system in real life. There's always some nonlinear aspect to it. But just notice that this spring only operates in a single direction. That's this extended or tension direction and it doesn't compress at all. So what that's telling me is that if it takes one newton to stretch this spring 10 centimeters, we can guarantee just from inspection that one newton in the opposite direction isn't going to compress it 10 centimeters at all. Therefore, it's not linear. But perhaps it's linear or nearly linear in the extension direction only. And we can test that with a real simple check. So I've hung this spring vertically now so that I can take advantage of gravity to convert mass, which will hang on the end, into force, which is going to stretch the spring. 
So I've already marked the neutral point for the spring on this piece of wood in the back, and I'll use that piece of wood to mark all of the new relative distances as I add mass to the spring. I'm going to add mass equivalent to 10 newtons of force at a time, and I'll add mass using this paint can, which already weighs 10 newtons, and I'll fill it up with water 10 newtons at a time. We'll mark it on the board, and then we'll graph it a little bit later. Okay, we'll stop here with 50 newtons for two reasons. Uh, the first is it's about to contact the ground, so that's going to mess up our test. But the second reason is that right around 50 newtons is the manufacturer's uh, recommended maximum operating force before uh, you run the risk of destroying the spring. So let's take the measurements that we have on the board here. We'll plot it out and see if we can get the spring constant from it. We made those six measurements in 10 newton increments, starting at zero newtons and going up to 50 newtons. And when we plot those six different points, we can get a pretty good idea of how the force of the spring changes as a function of its stretched distance. But remember though, the spring can't be compressed at all, so no matter how much negative force is applied, you'll never get any negative distance out of it. Now we only know what the curve looks like up to 50 newtons. And beyond that, we're not sure what the curve would look like, but we do know that if we increase the force high enough, eventually the spring was going to break. But what happens up there really isn't all that important. The only thing that really matters is that we avoid these nonlinear regions when we build this spring into a system. Now we lucked out a little bit here because this spring has a very nice, large, linear region right in the middle here. And so this is the operating region that we want to use this spring in, and we're going to design our system to use that. Now the slope of this line corresponds to the spring constant, which is approximately 94 newtons per meter. And since we're only going to use this in the linear region, we can describe the spring using this equation. Force equals 94 times x, where x is the distance. So now that we have our linear equation, let's use this spring in a system and build a linear harmonic oscillator. Now this is a pretty simple system where we're just going to suspend a mass from the spring. But the key is that the mass that we choose is going to be equivalent to 30 newtons. That way the spring at rest is right in the middle of our linear region. But the thing that the spring is attached to isn't stationary. It's going to be able to move up and down a distance of x1, and that's going to be our input into the system. And the distance that the mass moves, x2, is going to be the output of the system. If we draw a free body diagram of the mass, you'll see that there's three separate forces acting on it. There's a force up from the spring at rest, which is just equivalent to 30 newton. And then there's also the force of the spring that's due to its stretched and compressed distance. And finally, there's the force due to gravity, which is also equivalent to 30 newtons. And that force of gravity and the original force of the spring cancel each other out. And now from this, we can write the differential equation using Newton's laws, which states that mass times acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces. Now remember that x1 is our input, and x2 is the output of the system. So let's rearrange this equation so we can get them on opposite sides. Now we can take the Laplace transform of this equation to write it in the s domain, and then solve for the output divided by the input to get the transfer function for our system. And now we can use this transfer function to gain a lot of insight into our system. But notice that this is really just a normal second order system. And that might be a little bit more obvious if we just rewrite that equation into the standard second order form that you're probably already used to seeing. And from this relationship, we can see that the natural frequency, omega naught, is equal to about 5.54 radians per second. And also you can see that the damping ratio zeta is zero, which means there is no damping. But is that correct? Well, we didn't write out any damping when we wrote our equations of motion, so that much is true. But let's see what zero damping does to the Bode plot and see if that makes any sense in real life. Now remember for a second order system, the gain is approximately zero dB up to omega naught, then it falls off at minus 40 dB per decade, and right at omega naught, there's a peak that is approximately equal to 1 divided by 2 times zeta. And since zeta is 0, that means that this peak blows up to infinity. 
So without any damping in our system, if we input a signal at the frequency of the natural frequency, then our system is going to blow up into infinity, which isn't desirable, nor is it really realistic. And that's because all physical systems have a damping term, no matter how small. That is just the energy loss from heat being generated or sound being generated um, as the molecules push and pull against each other. So with that being said, a more realistic Bode plot for our system might be this yellow line, which has a little bit of damping. The same can be said for the phase of our system, which for a second order system starts at zero degrees, and if there was no damping, it would just shoot straight down to minus 180 degrees phase at the natural frequency. But with a damping term, it's going to be smoothed out, something a little bit more like this. We could also look at the characteristic equation of our transfer function and then map the poles and zeros in the s-plane. This system has two poles and they both exist on the real line at the positive and negative natural frequency. Of course, just like we did with the Bode plots, there's going to be a small damping term here. So really both of these poles are going to exist slightly in the left half plane. How slightly depends on the actual damping ratio of our system. Now there's one thing I want to show you with this s-plane map. Remember, it's kind of like a topo map of peaks and valleys, where each of the poles is an infinite peak. And in this case, the two poles being close to each other creates this mostly flat region in between the two. Now remember, along that real line is the frequency content. This is what we're plotting in the Bode plot. This occurs when you set the real component to zero and all you're looking at is the imaginary component in the s-plane. And so now you can see really easily where that infinite peak in the s-plane along the real line corresponds to the infinite peak in the Bode plot. And that mostly flat region in between the two is that mostly flat region in the Bode plot. So the Bode plot is really just a slice of the s-plane, which I think is kind of cool how all of this stuff is interrelated. But enough of all of this math, Let's go back to our real physical test and see if it behaves the way that we expect it to. Now, I had originally attempted to build a contraption that would input a sine wave into our system here, but due to an engineering flaw, it didn't work very well, and then I didn't have time to fix it. So now instead, you're left with me inputting the sine wave with my hand. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, but I think it's going to be close enough. And so we're going to start with real low frequencies here. I'm just going to move my hand up and down really slowly to simulate, uh, you, you know, like a tenth of a hertz or something like that. Something very, very small compared to the natural frequency. And what you can see here is that as my hand moves up and down, the mass moves up and down with my hand in phase and with the exact same amplitude. And that's exactly what we see here is really low frequencies, thanks to much, much lower than the natural frequency of the system, gain is 0 dB and phase is in phase. But if I input a little bit faster frequency, something closer now to the natural frequency, you can see I'm barely moving my hand at all and this uh, mass is moving all over the place. And that's because the gain is so much higher there near the natural frequency. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that, it's actually clicking. Uh, as it gets a little bit too high and it's getting to the nonlinear region of the spring. And lastly, if we go all the way up to the high frequency information, we should see almost no input make it through to the mass because it's dying off here at minus 40 dB per decade. So if I take the mass here and I input a very high frequency uh, sine wave input relative at least to the natural frequency, you can see that the mass isn't moving much at all, at least relative to my hand. And that's, because, oh, and that's because we're all the way up here in this high frequency information. So the general trend works out with real life. Low frequency information is basically passing it straight through, gain of zero, phase of zero. You get to the natural frequency and things tend to go a little bit unstable. Uh, but then as you get to higher and higher frequencies, none of that, in, none of that uh, input signal makes it all the way out. This is called a sine sweep. If we start at low frequencies, we can sweep through the entire frequency spectrum, measure the output, and we can draw this graph just from test alone. And that's one of the ways that we can do system identification without actually knowing what the system is comprised of by doing these sine sweeps. 
All right, before I end this video, there is just one other thing I just want to kind of tie it all together. So in order to do that, we'll go back to the blackboard. Now you might be thinking at this point, we just spent the entire video on the white box method. And that's because since we knew we were dealing with a spring and mass system, we were able to write the equations of motion directly. And then after we developed those equations, we were able to go and test them. But what's interesting is that we actually performed the black box method when we tested our equations of motion. Now recall with this method, we don't actually know what's inside the black box. So we have to subject it to various inputs and measure the output and see if we can deduce what's inside the box through that way. So for example, we could have started with a low frequency sine wave as the input. Then we could have plotted the measured output on a Bode plot for that particular frequency. Then we could have just increased the frequency a little bit higher, and then a little bit higher again until we filled in all of the frequencies that we are concerned with. Once we filled out the entire Bode plot, we can look at the graph and then determine what the system is from that. Now this is pretty easy with a second order system but it gets a little bit more complicated as the order of the system gets higher, but it can still be done. And if you look at the inputs that we sent in from the low frequencies all the way up to the high frequency, this is called a sine sweep because the inputs sweep through the entire frequency spectrum. But this isn't the only way to input the entire frequency spectrum. Another way is with a step input. If you remember from Fourier analysis on a step input, it contains some amount of every single frequency. And this is really useful because sometimes you can input a step into your system just by turning it on. So it's a lot simpler. And in our case, our step response for our system would look something like this with a damping term and a frequency term. And this corresponds to two poles just slightly to the left of the real line, exactly as we expected. So now in this video, I've showed you a couple different methods of how we go about identifying a system. And this is really important because having a good model of your system is crucial for designing a good control system. And we'll cover a few more techniques as we evolve in these videos and, and start talking about designing control systems. But at least now, hopefully, you have a little bit better understanding of the process for system identification. Of course, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the section below. And as always, thanks for watching.